You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're continuing our history series. Well, wrapping up our history yeah. series today with Dr. McKenzie in just a moment as we look at the Puritan movement. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. Dr. McKenzie, welcome back to The Coffee Hour. Great to have you back with us. Serve, uh, I should also give his official title. I don't think I did that oh. yet. Reverend Dr. Cameron <laughs> McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, welcome back. I was just so excited about the history. I just wanted to jump right in. That's okay. I like to jump right in too, and I'm not even sure of my own title. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Right. Last time, last week when we met, we we talked to, alluded to the exclusion crisis. What was the exclusion crisis? Yes, the exclusion crisis had to do with whether a Catholic could succeed to the throne of England. And this became an issue in the 1670s and 1680s because the heir to the throne under Charles II was his brother, James, who had been revealed as a Catholic in 1673 when on account of the Test Act, he had to resign his offices because the Test Act said, Basically, you had to accept Anglican communion, deny transubstantiation, or you couldn't be in the government. And James was a Catholic, so he had to resign. So this meant that when Charles died, England faced the prospects of having a Catholic king. So the first political party in English history, usually called the Whigs, organized initially to win elections to the House of Commons for the purpose of passing a law that would prohibit a Catholic from inheriting the throne. And these laws are called exclusion bills. And there are a series of parliaments and a series of efforts. And in every instance, the Whig party prevailed in common. They are passing these bills, but in order for a bill to become law, it must pass the House of Lords, and it must also be accepted by the king. And the king would not accept an exclusion act. Moreover, he was assisted in the politics of this when some of the leading Protestants actually organized a conspiracy against the king on account of his resistance to the Exclusion Act. This was known as the Rye House Plot. And it was designed, if I'm memory, memory correct, correct, that it was they were going to assassinate the heir to the throne, so that would ensure a Protestant attend getting the throne instead of James the Catholic. At any rate, it was discovered. They were discredited. Some fled. Others were tried and executed. But this was a way in which now Charles could say, see, it's this other side that does not uh, believe in the rule of law. They're the traitors, and so we, we shouldn't be listening to them. Also, Charles is a smart politician. Toward the end of his reign, because there was all this kind of fear about the Catholics, he started enforcing those laws against the Catholics much more vigorously than he had been before so that people could say, oh, no, the government really is not going to let the Catholics prosper and so forth. So that was another thing uh, that he did. So by the end of his reign, the exclusion crisis is over. He has prevailed, not his parliamentary foes. And he dies in 1685. As I said on an earlier occasion, he becomes a Catholic on his deathbed. And when he succeeds to the throne, or when he... It, dead, his brother, the Catholic, becomes the King of England. This is in 1685. This is James II. Now, in terms of his personal character and ability, James II was one of the better Stuart monarchs. He was hardworking. He was honest. He was well-intentioned. But from the outset of his reign, James showed that his model for kingship was much more like that of an absolute monarch, think again of his cousin Louis XIV in France, than it was of a parliamentary regulated monarch. So James uses royal power to overcome 
parliamentary provisions, including and especially those laws aimed at his co-religionists, the Roman Catholics. Now, he begins simply enough by issuing declarations of indulgence to individuals, individuals whom he wants to serve in government. They can't do it legally, but he can, you know, say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to enforce the law against so-and-so so that he can hold this position. And that meant positions in government, positions in the universities, and positions within the army. Now, these things kind of stun and scare people. Uh, it's not clear that James ever thought to impose Catholicism, but he thought people would follow his example and they would convert uh, to Catholicism. Well, all right. So James is king. He has to call for a parliament. He does. And the majority in the parliament are supporters of the king. They're not Whigs. They're the other political party that develops in this period. They are Tories. And they're supporters of the king. They're supporters of the Church of England. So it looks like things will be going oh, his way. But then some things happen that change the political dynamic. First of all, there was an uprising, a rebellion against James II that was led by an illegitimate son of Charles II, the Duke of Monmouth. This is in summer of 1685. It fizzled badly. So nothing much comes of it. The pretender was caught, tried, convicted, and executed. But James was not concerned with a mild policy. He wanted a severe policy to show that he meant business. So he sent the chief justice of England out there to deal with the rebels, a fellow by the name of Jeffreys, and he dealt very harshly with anybody remotely connected with this. 300 people were executed. 800 more people were exiled to the West Indies so that even members of parliament were shocked by the violence of the king uh, reaction. Um, another thing happened in 1685 that alarmed the English, and that was James's cousin, Louis XIV, repealed the Edict of Nantes. Now, the Edict of Nantes had guaranteed certain basic Protestant political privileges, religious privileges, and now that was canceled, and that sent a flood of Huguenot Protestant refugees from France, from the Netherlands to Prussia, and indeed to England. And it kind of confirmed an idea that people like Titus Oat, Popish Pot, had also kind of promoted. And that was that absolutism, Catholicism, tyranny, they all went together. So that if the King of England is a Catholic, he's probably potentially a tyrant. So... James is trying to do right, but he's trying to do right in a wrong that scares people about a religion that scared people too. Now, in 1686, James's, James's declarations of indulgence were brought into court. And this was just giving these dispensations to Catholic individuals, but he brought into court and in the court, James prevailed. <laughs> court of the Common Law sat, sat on banc, a group of 12. They heard the case, and by a vote of 12 to 1, they agreed that the kings of England, I'm quoting again, are sovereign princes. The laws of England are the king's laws. Therefore, it's an inseparable prerogative in the King of England to dispense with penal laws in particular cases and on particularly necessary reasons. So the king had the right to do what he was doing. Now, this was not entirely agreed with by many of those in Parliament because before this thing had been approved by the courts of common law, James had actually dismissed six of the judges whose opinion he wasn't sure of. So he kind of packed the court to get the decision that he wanted, okay? Well, this progressed the next year to James not just doing this on an individual basis, but actually issuing a declaration of indulgence as a little sidelight here 
William Penn helped him to write this thing. And this was, and of course, Penn was one of the great advocates of religious liberty. And that's what this thing did. It gave religious liberty is what it said. It's the royal will and pleasure that from henceforth the execution of all and all manner of penal laws and matters ecclesiastical be immediately suspended. Well, Quaker, Baptists, Roman Catholics, all of them were thrilled this little thing, uh, but there are others who were kind of cautious about it because the declaration went on and said, we cannot but hardly wish as it will easily be believed that all the people of our dominions were members of the Catholic Church. <laughs> and James confidently expected that lots of people would be converted to the Catholic religion. And he proceeded now to appoint even more men to positions of influence in the Privy Council, justices of the peace, and at the universities. And there was one very interesting episode that took place in 1687 when at the universities, it's kind of like other governmental agencies, only Church of England members could teach or go there as students. Well, there was a Roman Catholic. James wanted the fellows of Magdalen College at Oxford to elect as their head of college. Well, they refused. James fired all 25 of the Maudlin scholars and appointed Roman Catholics to replace them all. This meant that Oxford now had a completely Catholic college. And again, that's scaring people. 20% of the justices of the peace that he appointed were uh, Catholics. There are others, Protestants, who are not getting their posts. So they're jealous not only through the religion, but also for their social position in their area. And uh, James just seems to be uh, going along with uh, promoting Catholicism wherever he can. Um, he issued another declaration of in indulgence, the second one. And for this one, he commanded that the Anglican clergy actually read that declaration from their church pulpits. This was in 1688. So, so they were supposed to read what the king had said about granting religious liberty to non anglican well, this proved to be too much for the Archbishop of Canterbury and six other Anglican bishops. They refused and publicly petitioned the king to rethink this matter. The king ordered them arrested and tried on a charge of public a seditious libel against the king. And then they were brought before the courts of the common law. And we have one of the most famous examples of uh, jury nullification. No jury would find these guys guilty. They were all declared innocent, in spite of the fact that on paper and legally, they actually were guilty. Now, I've got a few more things here that I want to mention, but maybe we should take a little break. And yeah. And do it. Perfect. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. We're talking with the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. There is a lot happening under the reign of James II right now. A lot of religious liberty that's not so much actual religious liberty. What else is happening at this point in time? Well, James is using religious liberty and, and you know, in all sincerity, I'm not sure that he was thinking he was going to 
passed laws against the Baptists. He, he just, but he's interested in promoting the, the Catholic particularly. Well, James is in his mid 50s when he inherits the throne. So he's not a young man. And in those days, you know, you didn't usually survive much longer than that. So at least some Protestants, even though they're upset at what King James is doing, it's kind of okay because he's going to die and then the throne will be inherited by somebody else. Now, who's the somebody else? Well, early in his life, when James was still a Protestant, he had married a Protestant and he had had two daughters. One was named Mary and the other was Anne. And his brother, Charles, had arranged good Protestant marriages for both the girls. Mary was married to William III, who was the Stadtholder of the Netherlands. He's the Protestant champion against Louis XIV. And Anne was married to a Danish prince. So she's Lutheran, but that's, that's good enough at this point. Okay, so when James dies, we're going to go back to Protestant. That's kind of what everybody thought and believed. However, James foiled this, this idea because his first wife died and he married a second wife. And this was Mary of Modena, who was a Catholic and much younger than James. And in the spring of six, she gave birth. And although there was lots of prayers being said about his birth and lots of, lots of concern for it, the prayers and the concern of the Protestants went to naught because it was a baby boy who was born. And by the laws of primogeniture, that baby boy went to the head of the list in front of his two much older sisters. So this looked like for sure then that England would continue to be ruled by a Catholic dynasty and proved to be too much for the Protestant leaders in the parliament as well as throughout the country. Both parties, the Whigs and the Tories, refused to accept the idea that the new that they were going to have a Catholic king. The rumor was spread that the baby had been smuggled into the queen's bed in a warming pan and was not really an offspring of the king. And more importantly, they decided that they needed another monarch. James would have to go. So they entered into negotiations with Mary's husband, the older sister's husband, and that was William III, as I said, of the Netherlands. And he agreed to rescue the situation by coming over to England if they would accept him as king along with his wife as queen. If they would, he'd come to ensure Protestant rule in England. But he also was very much interested in getting England's help in his own wars against Louis XIV. Now, the actual invitation to William was actually signed by seven leaders, including the Bishop of London. But there were much, many, many others in the country who likewise felt the same way. Now, it wasn't a sure thing when he came. In November of 1688, William landed in England with just a small Dutch army of 15,000 men. There was a much larger English army available with 40,000 men that could have probably stopped him. The commander of the army was John Churchill, direct ancestor of Winston Churchill. And he was actually a friend of James as well as an officer of the king. But he refused to use that army against Charles II. So basically, John Churchill takes his army over to William and James is left high and dry. Instead of trying to raise additional soldiers and fight, he flees. James II flees London. He flees England. And William III, in the name of himself and his wife, take over in 1688. This is known as the Glorious Revolution. It's kind of a bloodless revolution. A couple of years later, James did mount a campaign. They fought in Ireland, the Battle of the Boyne. William won. If you're interested, piece of trivia here, the dynasty of William is the House of Orange. And so it's, that's the origins of the Orangemen, the Protestants of, of Ireland, over against the Irish Catholics, the Orangemen, basically loyal to William of Orange. All right. 
So William now summons another parliament. And in this parliament, it's the Whig party, the anti-Catholic uh, Stuart party that has a majority. And they pass uh, some series of legislation that will set England on an even stronger path toward constitutional uh, monarchy. Uh, they passed something called the Bill of Rights. Yeah, England not only had a civil war, they also have a Bill of Rights. And what this said was the king has to be an Anglican. He has to be a member of the Church of England along with his wife in order to succeed to the throne. It also forbids the king from suspending the laws. It forbids the king from maintaining an army or levying taxes without parliamentary consent. It forbids the king from interfering with elections and also interfering with freedom of speech in parliament. It guarantees the right of the people to make petitions to the king and also guarantees impartial juries and frequent parliament that need to be held. Interestingly, this is a parliament in this period is actually going beyond what parliament had ever done before because not only do they recognize William as the king along with Mary, and of course William had no kind of hereditary claim to the throne, they also pass legislation which names Anne as William and Mary's successor and it kind of skips over James and any of his descendants who would have had a, uh, would have had a better, better claim. This, of course, uh, just a piece of trivia. I mean, this is where we get William and Mary College in Virginia. It's named after the joint monarchs of William and Mary. Well, what about religion? The parliament also passes a toleration act. This is 1689. This one permits the nonconformists, the dissenting churches, the Presbyterians, the Kyriations and Baptists, gives them freedom of worship. Now, it's going to take a while before they are allowed to fully participate in the government, but now they can have their own chapels, they can have their own schools, they can have their own publishing houses. They get freedom of religion. In the very first year of the reign, 900 nonconformist churches were organized, and within about a decade, a little bit more than 1,500, about 2,500 churches had been organized by the end of Anne's reign. Well, what about the Catholic? Did they get anything out of this? The answer is no. Uh, in spite of Charles's and James's best efforts, the Catholics remained under all their old liabilities, and it was not until 1829, after the French Revolution, after Napoleon, that finally the, the Test Act was canceled and Catholics also received liberty of worship in England. And so that's about where we are. The important thing kind of religiously you can see is now Puritanism has devolved into these various different expressions of Christianity. We've got the Baptists, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians. We've even got the Quakers, especially over in America. We don't want to forget about the Anglicans. They now have, are on their own traje trajectory Book of Common Prayer, bishops now being absolutely characteristic of that form of Christianity. And we're, we're, we're getting, some people are starting to write in defense of religious liberty. And one of the more prominent of those is John Locke. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Locke in terms of being one of the champions of representative government from the 18th century. Well, he also wrote a very important work as a champion of religious liberty, his letters of toleration, he insisted that true religion was the inward and full persuasion of the mind. But he said that kings and governments have no more knowledge about that than anyone else. And if kings are going to insist that people believe if they've got it wrong, they'll send everybody to hell. So at any rate, religious liberty now becomes an issue within the Western mind and particularly is being championed in the English speaking world. So there we are. Man. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> Lots of great history. I now have about 50 questions, but... Yeah, I want to know more right. now. <laughs> we'll save that for another series. Oh, yes. Our guest for this series, the <laughs> Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 
Dr. McKenzie, thank you so much for sharing this series with us. It's been fantastic. You are very welcome. And again, I enjoyed it very much. So thank you for inviting me. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.